I'm going to talk a little bit about health coaching, but thanks again, Diane, for asking me to do this and for Greta for um, helping me do it and for Sarah for creating the flyer. Um, actually, I would love this to be a topic that's both personal but also professional. So I'd love for you to give me feedback and not have this be a lecture, but just more interactive. Um, because I think what you learn um, that helps you is also something that can also help your the people that you work with, not just patients, but family, et cetera. So please, when I get excited about something, which I love this topic, I go fast. So please help me slow down if I'm going too fast. All right. So the disclaimers are I'm an employee of UW Health. I work at the Kids Fitness Center. That's in my background. With the help of my coworker, Stephanie Martin, I was able to figure out how to do share screen. And so I appreciate her help on this. Um, Diane Scherchel has me doing some contract work for the Wellness Center as a health coach. So I'm currently working on the Tula project. Um, and it's a lot of the stuff I've learned about um, health behavior is um, part of the Noom. And I use that app personally and find it really helpful. So here we are. And what I have found in my experience in uh, pediatric fitness and working with people who are trying to lower their blood pressure and stop smoking and stop drinking and start exercising is that most of the time we know what to do. We've been told what to do. We think we're going to do it. But the problem is actually doing it. So it's not so much a matter of knowing. Most people know that. But the hard part is following through um, and changing the way that you do things so that you're making room for a different way. And I wish I looked like that when I took Carl Bach's yoga class, but that's what she is. <laughs> so what it comes down to is choice. Um, and which one? And it's not always one, it's not always the other. Um, both of them have reasons behind them, but every day from now on, we'll always have choice. And so um, the point of working with a health coach is to help you get to the choices that you want more often. So um, I'm gonna introduce myself a little bit and then Diane and Katie, who are also certified well coaches. I know there are more out there, Stephanie's a well coach, but um, we've been trained to ask good questions. Um, through a lot of different theories, uh, motivational interviewing, nonviolent communication, self-determination theory. So we've been trained in asking good questions. We're not therapists, um, but we're good question askers. Um, so I'll start. I found this picture, which I think is quite hilarious. That is me in the bottom row, third from the left. And I coach, I believe, because I've been surrounded by kind loving, supportive people. And I grew up thinking that um, there was always a reason why people do things. Um, as an athlete, I was always wondering why, you know, why would I be ready some races? Why wouldn't I? When I was coaching athletes, um, I found that the when somebody was unhappy with their performance, they absolutely didn't need me to tell them that they should be unhappy or that I was disappointed because I really wasn't. But all I would need to do is ask them what happened. Okay. So um, in my work in Pete's Fitness, it's the same thing. Um, what's going well? I mean, let's talk about exercise. So I coach because I'm always interested in why. Um, and I believe that when people understand their why, then they have the knowledge that they need to make a change. So that's my big extended family in the early 1960s. I don't, Diane, can you hop in on this one? I can. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Um, so, Ellen, thank you for doing this and thank you for um, inviting me to be a part of your conversation. So this is a picture of me. I'm on the far right with my kids and my husband. And, uh, you know, they're my why. I want to live a big, happy, healthy, long, good quality life with them and hike mountains and walk beaches and, you know, whatever comes our way. I want to be there and be there with them. Um, so, and that's really important, you know, finding our ground and finding why we're doing stuff is like step one, right? Um, and that's what we do with our whole health model. Uh, but how I got into this, I, I think back to the early portion of my career, right when I was starting out, I was working 
on campus at UW Preventive Medicine at an NIH research study, and we'd get called to go out and do talks. And I remember my first talk, and all, I put this talk together. I'm all excited. At the same time I was going to go do this talk, this book came out and hit the New York Times bestseller list. And, and I don't really remember the title of the book so much anymore, the title of my talk, but it was something about the 10 most important reasons to exercise. And I thought, man, if I go out and I tell these people all oh, this great information and share it, man, everyone's just going to start exercising, right? Well, it didn't work. <laughs> you know, over time, you know, it's what we all want to do. We want to educate people and we think if we tell them stuff, they're going to do it right. But it didn't quite work. And um, thankfully, I stuck with it and figured out new ways and other ways to, to help people because that was the whole thing. I wanted to help people, and I still do, live great, healthy lives. And... Um, and so over time, I came around to health coaching. And, um, you know, I, it's, it's one of the things that has changed my life for good and changed other lives. And I'm just so excited to be able to have the opportunity to go on a health co coaching journey um, with people. So that's why I do what I do. Thank you. And Diane is actually the one who told me about Well Coaches. So thank you. Katie Heiser. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I am very thankful to be involved in this today. Um, my <clears throat> history is a little bit different than everybody else's, but I, I do come from a, a coaching background many, 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 many years ago. And I did, uh, um, I've coached at all different levels um, uh, of swimming. And I found that it uh, was applying to the rest of my life and the rest of the people that I work with, I was using the same skills that I was using when I was coaching. So way back in 1980, I did, um, I worked with Dr. Morgan at the University of Wisconsin and uh, Madison in, in sports psychology, and I worked on the zone of optimal functioning and did some research with my high school athletes. And we were um, choosing, or we were uh, figuring out why they had good swims and why they had bad swims. And the um, research took us to figuring out how they felt before their best swims and how they felt before their not so good swims. So. Um, way back in 1980, I was going, oh, so you can kind of figure out how you want to feel and that would affect your performance. So that kind of snowballed everything into um, how I worked with my staff and finding how they were happiest and um, looking at where they were happiest. And that usually got the best out of them and their jobs. So I find once I got to the American Center, um, what? There's something that's called health coaching and I can actually uh, use those skills that I have been applying through most of my life with either my athletes or my um, coworkers and staff um, to actually help people feel better. And um, it was like one of those light bulb things. And Diane Churchill was also the one that um, enlightened me to the well coaches and brought me to this spot where, huh, this all really makes a lot of sense. And um, that's why I do what I do. And it may not be in a one-on-one a -on -one situation, a health coaching with a one client, but it works and uh, it has really made a difference in lots of areas of my life. Thank you, Katie. All right. So here's some familiar faces. Um, and I would love to thank them yet again for all their work um, to bring the whole health view more mainstream and allow uh, an exercise physiologist who is supposed to be using exercise as my tool to be able to look at the patients that we have with um, the whole health, with the community, preventative, and the things that affect you, and then also yourself. So this was an enormous breakthrough because it allowed me in my work 
to talk more about other things rather than just exercise because most of the kids who come here are not really that excited about exercise. They've said, no, don't do that. Um, and it just sort of legitimized and gave me the ability to say, okay, but there's more to it. Let's, let's dig a little deeper. And so really with health coaching, what we're going to focus on is the me. Um, and cause that is really the one thing that you have the most effect in terms of changing. Um, and as we know, things come at us from all over, but if we can figure out our, um, build a good, strong foundation for ourselves, um, listening to ourselves, this is where we have the most ability to make change. And then as we change and as we, as a community, um, who get grants and who lead mindfulness classes, as we change as a community and become kinder and bigger, that's how I think we're going to get a lot more kindness in the whole world. So whole health um, really gives us more opportunities to talk about what's going on with our patients. So for example, I would love the kids to leave here wanting to exercise, but if they have something else in the way, some big block barrier that they can't see behind, be, beyond exercise really isn't where I would start. So it just, just gives you a lot more opportunities. And I'm so thankful to um, Drs. Ryan Fletcher and Rakel and the fact that the VA has picked up whole health. Um, health coaching now is, um, is the preliminary CPT code so that it can ultimately be reimbursed as a part of the healthcare plan. So really what goes on with health coaching is that um, we're good listeners and good question answers. And so really we allow the participant to lead the discussion, which I think these days, maybe always, but I guess I'm just more aware of now that people really want to be heard. Um, and if there is a, a forum for them to just be heard, um, and then we can sort of get rid of some of the, the little dust bunnies and get to the big one. And that would be the gist of what health coaching is, allowing them to lead the, the discussion. And then as the coaches, we try to listen and look for little breadcrumbs um, and then ask a little bit more about that. Um, we try not to jump ahead and go to the loaf of bread, but follow the crumbs um, to find out what they're willing to work on. Um, and this allows us to open up the doors for readiness to change. So I would love this to be the time where you actually do some participation. If you can grab a writing implement and a piece of paper, you can go old school on me. Cause I'm gonna start with the, the, the three questions that we mostly start out with. So this is where you get to participate personally in this. So. Paper and pencil at the ready. One, two, three. Look how simple and easy this is. Actually, it's simple, but not easy. So the first question always is, what is the best thing that's happened? So it could be this morning. It could be the last five minutes. It could be this week. But I'd really love for you to think about what is the best thing that has happened recently? And then write it down. So you guys just participated, hopefully, by writing. But let me give you sort of the, the why behind this. This is the affirmative inquiry, um, starting out your visit with something positive. Um, and I always think about this when I, I pick up the kids at the entrance at 4.30 and 5.30. And the first thing I'll ask the two or three or four or five who come is, how are you doing? What's the best thing that happened today? And typically, oh, can I tell you the worst thing? Nope. <laughs> and the reason is you just sort of get that downward spiral. So yeah, I'm sure there's some bad things, but really, um, in a clinic visit or in a, any kind of a, an appointment, uh, what is the best thing that's happened? Number two, how do you refresh and recharge? So think of this scenario. You reported to work on times, helped your family get ready, whatever you do in the mornings, got to your desk, and I'm gonna just make it even better. Pretend it was me. There was a wonderful cup of warm coffee at your desk and you opened up 
your computer and you looked at your chart and there were no patients. You had no work. You were being paid. You were in a nice spot with a cup of coffee. <sighs> Nobody knows you don't have to work. Nobody's going to need anything. What do you do? How do you refresh and recharge? So this is a picture. I don't know if it's exactly Lake Michigan in Grand Haven, but that is my spot. And all I have to do is look at this picture and I just feel peaceful and calm and full and I have enough. And all of the people in my family that you saw in that silly old 1960 picture have been there. So this is where I feel calm and good. And I hope everybody has a spot. And of course, once we have a spot, we try to take some of the things that we do with that spot to our daily life. But it is really important to know how do you refresh and recharge? I don't really want to leave this picture, but I will. <laughs> and number three, so what's good? How do you refresh and recharge? And here's the big difference maker. What do you want so much that it pulls you and it's pulling the way that you are going to operate within your day? Sometimes things that you want can be a push. I have to, I should, the doctor told me to, I have, but you know what? Pushing only lasts for so long and it's hard to sustain being pushed. If you can switch it around so that it feels like a pull because I want it, because this is something that I'm willing to do and I'm not going to be perfect, but I'm going to try. So if you could individually, what is something that you're looking forward to? What is something that would make you proud or feel like, yeah, that aligns with what I want for this year and for me and for now? Okay, so we've started with the affirmative inquiry. We've tried to ask ourselves, how do we refresh and recharge? And maybe we have something that is so magnetic that we feel pulled to it. So then you would be willing to write some things down. However, sometimes these goals are more invisible than action. So you may be ready to start thinking about a change and pay attention to your thinking. Or you may, may be ready to actually do. Um, but if you haven't started out positively, you haven't got a way to refresh because actually every day things get piled on us that make us need to refresh. And if we don't, they just pile up and then a pull. All right, everybody tracking, everybody following, are we good? I can't see any faces, I'm gonna have to hear voices. All right. But then again, we get to choose, right? It always comes back to, well, last night it seemed like I wasn't gonna eat brownies for breakfast because I was so motivated. And then this morning I woke up late, there was no coffee left. The dogs needed to go outside. And, you know, by the time I was getting my keys, the, the brownie was the choice. And that's just the way it is. It's always going to be a choice, even though I wanted the apple. So this comes down then to, are you ready? Um, and so if I was just starting the phone call with you, um, I would probably try to do something like Lisa did in terms of starting out with something fresh, something to sort of get them into the moment and off the list and the to-dos and what I'm going to do right afterwards and while I have time. And I can do this coaching call, but I'm driving because I'm going someplace. But um, this is where we're going to start to dig a little deeper. And if you feel like you need to stand up and stretch, you need to um, refill your coffee, your water, whatever, this would be the time to do it. I'm going to give you guys a couple minutes to either um, have a discussion or just to ready to get a little bit deeper. So the getting deeper is really comes down to this behavior chain. Um, and I think 
I love this because it allows you to sort of break down the behavior. And when you understand it, it doesn't become as shaming and you don't feel as guilty about it. So all behaviors start with a trigger. And the trigger could be um, things from the environment. They can be um, things that are uh, emotional. Um, you saw something sad on the way to work. Um, it's a terribly snowy day. It's hard to get into work, but I can't call in because there's so many other people gone and what will happen with my patients. It could be a social interaction that was good or bad, but it definitely triggered um, some thoughts. Um, so the reason why we start with me <laughs> is because we can't control the triggers. They're out there um, and they are going to definitely affect what we do. Um, when I was doing health coaching for in the Tula app, I'm still doing it actually. What we're trying to find out with people who are trying to reduce their social drinking is what are those triggers? What is it? Where are you? Who are you with that um, think, makes you think, okay, that this is what we're doing. This is our social activity. Um, I also did some coaching for people who are trying to lower their blood pressure. Um, and so these are people who had health insurance, had a diagnosis of high blood pressure, had medications, were given the DASH diet, but there was something about following through on that that they couldn't do. And so just kind of rewinding back to what are some of the triggers um, is really, really helpful. So be aware of that and know that they're going to come at you um, from all over the place in the soft underbelly when you, maybe you're not quite ready for it. And triggers always lead to thoughts. Um, so this is where the mindfulness comes in is um, controlling your thoughts, being able to sift through the good and the bad and discard the things that aren't serving you. But um, it is absolutely going to impact. I mean, these are the stories that we tell ourselves. So you get the trigger. If you're not thinking, it's just a reaction and you're going to go down the slide of a behavior you may or may not want. Um, so pay attention to your thoughts. Um, here's where you would go a little slower. Try to think it through and not let it be a reaction. Um, some examples of this are um, one of my dear friends who I ride horses with is um, smart. She's a, a DVM, a vet, and she's also a teacher. Um, she is uh, interested in controlling her blood pressure and her diabetes. She's inherited these things. And so being the smart person that she is, she is I'm thinking, well, I'm going to start walking and running because I know that it works. And she's always full of energy and wanting to do it. And then when it comes right down to it, she's like, but I don't like it. Even though I know it's good, I don't like it. So then the question is, what are, what are some other ways? So even though that her, her trigger is trying to manage her health, her thought is this works for most people. This is um, going to work, but for her, it doesn't. And so she made the decision to, if she feels like running, she runs, but more importantly, she's walking her dogs and she's going out to see her horses. And that's where she's going to get her activity. All right. So we have the trigger. We have the thought, and um, that's where we want to sort of lean into the whole me thing. And then, of course, we have the action, which I could bring up the slide, but you know it, apple, brownie. Interesting that I, of course, my, my weakness is eating, overeating and emotional eating. So, of course, the brownie and the apple ring true to me. Um, but then the action is whatever you do. You, you, uh, you made a choice. You're doing it. Um, one of the things we've learned with all the mindfulness, so is that the action does not define you. Um, but only if, if you're thinking enough about the whole process, can you separate yourself from the action. So separating yourself from the action is a big deal. Um, if it's good, it's not, you know, that's wonderful. But if it's a bad action, then of course you want to make sure that you are isolating it, knowing it was a choice. And then of course we get to the consequence. Um, so the consequence could be physiological. Oh, that brownie was delicious physical, I shouldn't have had a whole row. Um, psychological, what is wrong with me? Why don't I have any willpower? Why can't, why can't I just say no to the brownie? Um, and then the emotions that follow, um, shame, the guilt, um, not being able to separate yourself from the action and just thinking there, what's wrong with me? I can't, I can't do this. 
Um, but again, I think when you break down behaviors into this, the trigger, the thought, the action, and the consequence, it seems a lot less daunting. And um, when you break it down, you can see parts of it where you know that you have low hanging fruit, you can make change and other things, no, that's gonna be a little tougher. So the behavior chain I think is really, really helpful. Um, and I think one of the key things in all of that is most of us have been working on a behavior for a while. Um, and to, to let yourself believe that um, <laughs> we start new this time. And just because it didn't work before doesn't mean it can't work this time. And that comes with sort of building your own personal belief, um, detaching yourself from the action and letting go of shame. And my dogs, it's like 30 seconds. They let go of it right away and <laughs> continue to wreak havoc on our house. So with that, that kind of gives us a little bit of a starting point, but I'm going to pause here. Does anybody have any, any questions about um, the behavior change, the questions one, two, and three? Okay. Ellen, I'm wondering um, that uncoupling of, of behavior and, and kind of self-perception or, mm -hmm. you know, you aren't the choices or uh, the shame that comes with that. Is that, are there tools that you like to use with people on that or directions that you'd like to uh, help you? Because I, I see that in my patients and you know, certainly, I think a lot of us feel that way. And so how, how do you help people kind of uncouple that um, identity or, or self value versus behaviors? Yeah, I think it comes with, first of all, setting some, some basis of trust that I am here to help you. I'm not a therapist, but I'm gonna ask questions. Um, and then asking them, I'll go um, with Pete's Fitness. You know, you're hearing a lot about health and exercise and nutrition today. How does exercise fit into your day? Well, it doesn't. How do you spend your day? Well, I do this, this, and this, and this. Um, and what are the most important things for you in a day? And so just by asking those kind of questions, I get a little bit better feel for them. Um, and if they say, well, the most important thing for me is school. And then the second most important thing for me is my friends and fun. And the third most important thing is this or that. And if exercise isn't even in the top five, then I'm not even talking about exercise, but I probably will talk about why your physician asked them to come here and how do their parents feel about exercise? And are you happy with where you are? Are you feeling good right now? Does that help? Because honestly, yes. I can't really, like, for example, let's go back to like the Tula app. These are people who are interested in reducing social drinking. They're not teetotalers. They're not alcoholics, but they have found that that habit of drinking um, socially, they would like to decrease it. So then I'll just ask them, you know, because we're talking about alcohol. So when are the times that you drink? Um, what are, what are the situations and when you drink, what, what is that doing for you? And most of them will say, I'm relaxing. I'm rewarding myself. I am escaping. And so, you know, then what we can do is say, okay, so these are all things I need. Clearly I need enough more tools, more ways to reward myself, more ways to relax. Um, and once I identify those, can I put those in a situation where I have more triggers, environmental triggers or social triggers? But it's mostly through asking questions and, and they'll give me what they can give me. Ellen, I can, I can give an example if you'd like, a very quick example that is fresh on my mind from a therapy session this morning and, and then maybe if it if it's not applicable, you could say, well, that's too much like therapy. <laughs> Go for it. No, I'd love this. Okay, perfect. So um, I had a patient come in this morning who um, who talked a lot about irritability. And I said, um, I said, you know, irritability is is uh, is on a continuum. Let's talk about let's talk about irritability. And and most actions are actually on a continuum. So then I said, is is it? Is the irritability, is that something that you catch and feel when um, your jaw starts to get a little bit tense and 
um, when you start to have racing thoughts or you just feel a little bit of pressure, like you're a pop bottle that's kind of shook up or, um, or you just start to feel your heart racing a little bit, is it there? Or is it to the point where in your head, you're starting to think um, really negative things like, man, this is gonna be a terrible day. And man, this is really gonna be frustrating. I don't wanna have to talk to this person today. Or is it to the point where you are saying things that you really, uh, that you really are feeling and you're saying it with like that feeling of tension and you're frustrated? Or is it to the point where you've already said the thing and then you notice that there's like a response coming at you? Or is it to the point where you've said the thing, you notice there's a response coming at you, and then you feel bad because the other person feels hurt? And this is, a, this is an example that all of us can relate to because we've all unfortunately been there. Uh, if we haven't, we're, you know, Jesus or Mother Teresa or something like they're the Buddha. But I mean, basically, we can all relate to it. And and it really parses that out. And, and that example actually gets them thinking a little bit more about the physiology and kind of the way their thoughts are affected and then kind of how it just bursts forth and then how they see the effect on the other person and then how they feel bad afterwards. And I have a lot of people who are super duper caring and wonderful people who don't notice any of this until they notice that someone has been hurt and then they feel bad. And those same people are often the same people who are overeating. And then they notice at that point, oh, I feel bad, I wish I hadn't done that. And so all of that can be parsed out and looked at. And, and then I can talk to them. I say, you know, before we start like the actual therapy therapy, we're gonna be talking about really hard stuff. Let's do some, let's do some parsing out of what's happening here and give you some relaxation and some coping skills so that when we tar start talking about some of this hard stuff that's gonna be really meaningful and transformative, you have some ways to manage when you start to feel overwhelmed inside and like a pop bottle that's been kind of shook up. That's fantastic. You know, and I, I was thinking, I'm looking at this slide as you're talking and so they, the irritability was their consequence right? Maybe. And the action, or maybe the consequence was somebody feeling bad, but you can almost like figure out which, which part of it and then try to backtrack or go forward from it. Um, but realizing there are different stages and you're right, recognizing physiologically what's going on. Um, and then I can take them back to like the trigger a little bit more and address that stuff later. But mm -hmm. I often don't address that Right away, I just start with the physiology because people know what that feels like in their body. And with kiddos, you can draw like a little outline of a body, you know, like, <laughs> mm -hmm. and be like, where do you feel the frustration? Is it a butterfly in your stomach? Is it, um, is it feeling like there's something clamping down on your jaw? Do you get pressure behind your head? Um, I mean, the, everyone, all of us are sort of human, I think anyways, <laughs> and we can, we all feel a lot of the same feelings. Sometimes it manifests differently. Um, but you know, this all relates to, to, um, a whole health really, because, uh, if people aren't eating right and they're not full or satiated and they're just eating a lot of junk food, they're going to be irritable and anxious too. So I, I actually work on the relaxation first, and then we look at like, what is actually triggering? Cause people don't know sometimes, sometimes it is a physical need to release stress. Sometimes it's emotional. Sometimes they're just emotional because they're not full. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other people who have dealing with this in their practice or themselves, any other thoughts you guys want to share about the chain of events? Can I jump in real quick? Um, Please. Newish to the group. My name is Toral, and um, I'm a mindfulness teacher, but also I'm a, a mental health coach and a life coach. And one of the things that really um, struck me with what you just shared um, about the leaning into the body is just there has to be some trust and rapport with the client or the participant. 
That's from a trauma informed perspective. Sometimes going into the body can be difficult, especially if the behavior is born out of some kind of trauma or trauma response. So just something to name and note that just as you know, the history of the, the client to sort of understand where there might be an entry point. So, in the mindfulness world and in mental health coaching, um, we look at all of the, the sort of cycle of things that we have um, the anatomy of a response. You know, that anatomy can include our thoughts, um, that it, can, it can include our phys physical sensations, and it can include behaviors or urges. And what I often will ask a client is, where in all of this is it the hardest for you? Is it the behavior? Like, where are you experiencing the most difficulty? Because we may make an assumption that it, the hardest part is the urge or the hardest part is the thought or the hardest part is the consequence, but that might not actually be true for what's causing the sort of cycle of this habit to play out. And that consequence then becomes its own new trigger and starts a whole new sort of pattern. So if we can give sort of agency to the client and ask, where is this most difficult for you? Is that where you'd like to spend some time? Then that can become its own doorway and that builds that trust so that they're able to and willing to then maybe dig a little bit more deeply and see what's maybe getting in the way or informing that behavior going forward and even explore possible opposite action as they go uh, looking into the next steps. Some thoughts. Mm -hmm. That's lovely. And I'm so thankful that we have so many people on our team because with Peds Fitness or with the Tula app, there are people who need a whole lot more than <clears throat> what I can do as a health coach. And so it's so nice to know that um, I'm just getting started with them and their journey may include many other things. Um, but thank you for your perspective on that too. So we sort of have a starting point. Um, and just like it takes you time to put these letters into a word, that is how we live our lives, sort of um, shuffling and spelling out a word and sort of prioritizing. Um, and I think most of the people that I see are here for a behavior change, whether it's um, hypertension, exercise, um, eating, um, trying to slow down smoking or alcohol. People, we do what we do because it works for us. Um, and whether you realize it or not, you've, you've pretty much got it figured out in your head. Um, and so this is where it's important to ask, what are the most important things? Um, my job, my family, uh, whatever it is, finding out what their priorities are, because once they let you know where the priorities are, then, then you have something to work with. Um, you know, For me just to, to lead with exercise, exercise now has to become your priority. I'm not going to get very far with these kids. And in addition to them not wanting to exercise, I've also put up a barrier between myself and the kid because I'm not listening. <laughs> I'm telling them that they have to do something that they have adamantly decided not to do. Um, and I, I'm just using the kids, but I think we've all experienced that. It's like, um, take your medication. Okay. They come back to the next appointment. You didn't take your medication. No. Why? I don't know. I didn't want, you know, so that's where the problem is, is just trying to figure out how um, can we maybe reshuffle things and make taking your meds or make whatever it is that you, whatever's pulling you, make it more of a priority. Um, so that, that's going to take a little shuffling. Now, luckily there are tools for that if, if they're not sure, but even just asking the question and having them sort of think about that can be helpful. Um, but really, most of the time, what we're asking people to do is to um, work on their inner strengths, to work on the things that make them feel safe, satisfied, and connected. Um, because when those three areas are good, then you have enough inner strength to be able to make some change. And so when people talk about resiliency, I'm pretty sure that they mean these things, you know, you're... You feel safe where you live. You feel safe where you work. You feel safe in your community, which is kind of an ironic thing to be saying in this COVID world, but safety is a really big deal. And so knowing what you need to be safe and, and putting yourself in situations where you feel safe. Um, satisfying is that you, you have enough, that it's not just that next thing. Um, when After my mom died, um, I'm a huge family. I'm one of five, and then my mom remarried, and there were uh, eight of them, so there were 13 of us, and we're, you know, trying to put things away. 
and, you know, give things away. And about a month or two after my mom died, one of my sisters called and said, oh, Ellen, what did you do with mom's pearls? And I said, oh, um, I gave those to Becky. Oh, she said, dang it. I was just thinking, I just wanted those pearls. If I had those pearls, I'd feel so much better. <laughs> and, you know, it was just, no, it's not the pearls. I'm just sad. I'm lonely. I don't feel good. And no amount of pearl necklaces, shopping, eating is going to take care of that. So really coming back down to sort of the inner strings of um, safety, satisfaction, and feeling connected and cared about and listened to. Because you're still going to have to make that decision. Um, and craving comes from that feeling of there's not enough. There's not enough. I'm not satisfied. I'm not connected. I don't feel safe. I, I haven't built a, a strong foundation for myself. So I know this is something that we hear ad nauseum, but because we're higher level thinkers, we really can sort of break it down into, you know, the basic physiological things. Like you were saying, the mental health specialist is, am I getting enough sleep? Am, am I moving at all? Um, whether it's just purposeful movement in my day, or I'm taking the time to do more specific exercise, Am I choosing nourishing food versus um, food that just is fast and uh, maybe doesn't provide the nourishment that I need? And how am I doing my relaxation? So there's a, an author named Michelle Seeger, and she's at the end of this. And she talks a lot about your personal bottom line for self-care and sort of identifying what those needs are, identifying, you know, keystone habits. Like if your superpower is your sleep, and you're not getting enough sleep, most other things are going to sort of fall by the wayside or eventually it's going to accumulate where you crash because you haven't got enough sleep. So whatever those keystone self-care habits are, to try to really look inside and what are those? Um, I think COVID has been a really nice time for us to be able to just sort of take that inside look because for a long time, you know, the way we did our work was completely changed. So Michelle Seeger does a lot of, of work on this. And then who are your support people? Are you hanging out with people who lift you up? Or are you hanging out with people who are saying, get back down here with us, get down here. Um, being discerning. Um, that was another thing about COVID. I think, you know, it was an introvert's dream. Nope, can't do it. Nope, can't go out, nope. Um, so aligning yourself with people who are supportive is very, very crucial. Um, I'm gonna kind of go back to this one. This um, inner strength work is from a guy named Rick Hansen. He's a PhD and he does a, a lot of writing and blogs and stuff, but he writes for the Greater Good, um, Greater Good Health Center from Cal Berkeley, Greater Good Science Center. Um, and so he's got really good daily tools. He's got um, just one thing, lots of access to things on the web to just help you be aware of your um, inner strengths. And who is and who isn't? Um, this is always rears its little ugly head to me um, in this, you know, time of, you know, so much division politically in our fam, even in my family. It's like, wow, I didn't know you felt that way. And so just knowing what topics to bring up and who to bring it up with and just protecting yourself so that you don't expose yourself to um, a hit that you weren't thinking was coming. And it's, it's, it's dicey. This is something, I don't know if you, any of you have done Noom, um, but where this comes in is, so I've decided I'm positive. I know how to relax. I have the poll. I want to make a change. This is someone who was doing the Noom app, not me. Um, but she, this was her way of checking in. So how do I know if I'm doing the right thing? How do I know if the behaviors are getting me the, the numbers the, on the scale that I want? And so she showed me this and I was just focused on that middle and how many points she had in the middle. And all she could focus on was that the last dot was the, the highest one in a long time. So it is important to check in to know what you're going for, to be able to check your outcomes. But I would um, be careful not to always have it be numbers because especially in weight loss, um, what we're doing with kids and the Pete's Fitness is they're gonna gain muscle, 
they're going to lose fat and the scale may not change, but their body changes. So behaviors trump numbers, but numbers are important because it just gives you an idea of how to check in. How am I doing on my goal? And so for those of you who are actually um, really having a New Year's resolution and um, how long does it take to establish a new habit? I remember when I started working in this field oh so long ago, things were a little bit tighter. Like when exercise had to be 60 minutes at a certain heart rate and there are only certain things that counted and now we've loosened up all of that. It used to be that it takes two months, three months to establish a habit, but I think all of us know that it takes forever. Hmm. And the reason is once you get there, are, how are you, are you going to change how you do things? Because if you were only going for the destination and you got there, what's next? And if that pull is strong enough that it aligns with who you really want to be, then it doesn't matter if it takes forever because you're going to enjoy the journey and you're going to give yourself a little grace if it's not perfect, but you do have sort of the tools to get started again. So for example, um, you you wake up and there's like a week or two where you just can't think of anything good. <clears throat> You're back at number one. I can't think of anything good. Well, then we know we need to go back to that that inner inner strengths. Do I feel safe? Do I feel satisfied? Do I feel connected? So the journey is going to be constant and it's um, you can maybe adjust your goal where you're headed to, but you're always going to be walking the walk and hoping it aligns um, with feeling that good, strong foundation. And I love that this journey has snow in it. So that's that's kind of the gist of it. I would love to hear any thoughts or questions from people. If I lost you on anything, please let me know. Um, in earlier conversations, uh, one word that I, that I heard Two words really that stuck out was um, assumptions and listening. Um, as a coach, a provider, uh, a friend, uh, you know, we always have to check our assumptions and watch out for them. And that's actually called listening too. Um, listening to what uh, the person is saying and not making assumptions. I think one of the scariest parts of coaching early on for me was, you know, I'd walk into a coaching session and I might have like these pre ideas of what was going to happen or where, how we were going to proceed with the coaching session. And I had to really just like set those aside um, and not bring those to the conversation because you did not know what the other person was bringing to the conversation. And it's really all about the other person and not making these assumptions and listening to what they say and trying to guide them from, you know, from what you're learning from them. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think when I first started, because my background was as an exercise physiologist and I was sort of used to telling them what to do, I had to really let go of, um, what if I don't have anything valuable to them? What if they have a question and I can't answer it? And what I realized is, I don't, the goal is not for them to leave with, you know, the goal is for them to want to do something else and support them in whatever that is. And it's nice that we get time as a health coach. I mean, I know that so many providers, you got 15 minutes and it's, it's hard to do it all. So it's nice to know, okay, maybe there's more here. There are other people who can get involved. I'd be curious to hear some, um, maybe uh, some, some favorite success stories. And then, you know, also maybe like um, working with individuals that, that maybe wasn't as successful or, or what you think might have um, not been right at that time for that individual that it, it didn't work so well. I, um, I had one last week that was kind of interesting. So we're a pediatric fitness clinic. Um, and this patient came in um, because her old primary care physician was now um, working in Peace Fitness, Blaze Nemeth. So she had just finished her freshman year in college and she was home for break. And 
um, every six months they have the opportunity to have a DEXA scan so we can look at what percentage of their weight is muscle, what's bone and what's fat. And then we also do um, a submaximal treadmill walking test so we can assess their, uh, predict their max VO2. And so this girl came back and her mom was sitting at the table um, grading some papers and I, the girl and I were on the treadmill. And so I just talked to her about how school's going and what she liked and how she was feeling. And one of the things that she was pretty proud of is that um, it's a tiny little school in Minnesota, but at 10 o'clock at night, she and some of her girlfriends would all get together and they would walk and they would talk. And I thought, oh my gosh, that makes me happy on so many levels. One is that instead of eating popcorn and watching movies, you guys are walking. The other is that you're outside at 10 o'clock at night and you feel so safe that you can just walk outside and enjoy each other. Um, and then we did the rest of her test and you know, she was walking at, she's a pretty tall girl. She was walking at two and a half miles an hour. She had a 5% grade. Her heart rate was right where we thought it should be in terms of um, burning fat between 65 and 85% of her max. So it was all good. Then she walked over to get the scan and I sat down and talked to her mom and her mom was, I said, so how are you thinking things going? Oh, what she just did there, that doesn't do anything. You know, if that's how hard she's going to work, no wonder she's still fat. She's not going to lose anything at that. I'm like, and she was so sure about her theory that that was the wrong intensity that I kind of, wow. And I said, well, I told her what her heart rate was. She goes, well, that wouldn't work. If that's how easy it is, no wonder she's not losing. She's got to work a lot harder. And what occurred to me is it really, there was nothing this little girl could do that was right. So the, the emotions were getting in the way of her, her exercise, no matter the fact that she developed this lovely habit, the fact that she was doing exactly what I'd asked her to do. And she had, I had confirmed that yes, this is the right intensity level. It wasn't going to be good enough because it wasn't what her mom said. And it was really painful to hear, but she, you know, luckily she's in college, but when you're around that all the time, I mean, talk about the dragon. Uh, yeah, it's, it's hard. So for me to say to her, this is perfect. And for her mom to say, no, that's not good enough. Um, that's where you get those other triggers that are leading to not being successful. So I guess the success was for me to understand where it came from, to assure the mother that that was one way, but that wasn't the only way for her daughter to lose. Um, and that the way that worked for the mom wasn't necessarily going to work for the daughter. Um, but also to have a little bit more kindness for the mom, because she just felt like, I don't know if she felt like she had, her daughter had to, was lazy or something. I don't know. It was really painful to listen to. So it was not successful, <laughs> except for my parting words with the daughter. And I say, I feel like there was some success around that. Um, and maybe it's just sort of like a stepping stone or springboard success. Um, it's hard when you work with an individual and then the family system gets in there too, uh, because you are treating an individual within a system. Um, and then we also become part of the system too. And what I see happening is that negativity gets really, it, it becomes contagious. Um, and positivity is also contagious. I mean, I, I feel it like I feel the positivity. I work with a lot of these IFM folks and I walk into their pod and they're just happy and bopping around. And I, I feel that and it feels really good. Um, and I would say that uh, I only recently ran into this book, but I really like it. It's an old book. It's called change your questions, change your life. And it has a beautiful, um, it has a beautiful map on it that talks about two different paths you can take with the questions you're asking yourself. And one path is the learner path and the other path is the judger path. And it talks about how the judger path asks questions like what's wrong with me? Why did I do this? Why isn't this working? And then the learner path is like, what, you know, what am I here for? And what do I want to get out of this? And how can I, how can I improve this? And even as I ask those questions myself to you guys, I feel better. Like I feel great. And sometimes I think a mental model or a visual can be really useful. So if you want, um, I can send a photograph of that um, to Dr. Koopal if other folks are interested, because I think it might be useful um, uh, for, for you. And I applaud the work that you do because working with peds is, and their families is much harder than working with adults in some ways, which is what I do. Um, except they're silly. 
that's fun. And then, and of course I get to be in this big, beautiful room, which is also nice. So thank you. Yeah. It was hard. I guess with that mom, I, I did take another step where I, I said, now this is what's happening. And she's doing all this exercise and you're thinking it's not good enough. So she feels like this. And the only way that anything can happen is if, if you maybe back up a little bit, maybe she could move forward. But what you're telling me that you're leading with love, I don't know if she feels that it's love when you say that's not good enough. That's not, that's not going to work. So, you know, just saying, give her a little space. She's in college now and maybe it'll come this way. But if you're like this, there's only one place for her to go. So, and I felt like I could do that because I'd seen them before and I'm an old lady <laughs> with kids. I have a question. I just put it in the chat. This is Mary Pat Hank. And um, I was just wondering how long you get to spend in a coaching session, because I do think time is, you know, all of us work on developing relationships and trust and, and you know, doing it in 15 minutes is kind of tough. So I'm curious how, how long is a normal coaching session? Um. Well, I, Diane, I think you might want to wait on that one, but I know when I'm doing the stuff for Tula or um, when I have the kids here, here, I, I see them after they've already seen some other people. So I have at least 15, 20 minutes, but when I'm doing just a straight on coaching, it's about, I give them up to an hour. They may not need the whole hour, but I give them up to an hour, okay. but you're right. Time is so important. Yeah. And just to add to that, um, when we actually, um, a person signs up for health coaching sessions with the Center for Wellness. Um, the coaching model we use is the first session is about an hour in length. It's the get to know you session and um, lots of explorations. And then we're gonna work for 11 more weeks with this person, um, hopefully weekly. Uh, sometimes it's by, it sort of depends on the schedules, but the sessions then are like 20 to 30 minutes in length. So you get all this beautiful time to explore. Um, and to have successes and not so much successes and learn from each of those, you know, and, and use rulers to measure and, um, and, and help them move forward. And, um, we use a three month model because three months is enough time to get something done, but. It's also a short period of time, so there's some urgency to it. So if you're going to get something done in three months, uh, we have to work on it and start working on it. Thank you. That's great. Uh -huh. So continue with your thoughts and questions, but I wanted to let you know um, that there are some tools. So the readiness to change is something that was written. I wrote it a while ago. Um, BIA character strength survey is another way for one of those first appointments where you might have somebody who's having a hard time seeing anything positive. They just, they're just not sure. And so um, this is a way for them to find out what their strengths are. And um, it's by the University of Pennsylvania. It's part of a research study, but you get to answer questions and then it ranks your strengths from your first strength all the way to 24th. So 24 is not a bad thing. It's just that it's not as strong as your one or two or three or four. And taking that made me realize, oh, that's why Michigan feels so good to me. I mean, my number one strength wasn't kindness or love or anything. It was a love of nature and excellence, nature and beauty or something like that. Rick Hansen is the person who talks about inner strengths. Um, he's a PhD. He works out of um, Cal Berkeley. Michelle Seeger is the one who talks about uh, sustainable behavior change and personal bottom line. And Numa's just gave me a lot of more insight into um, cognitive behavioral therapy. And I, I'm a personal user. This is um, about coaching at the American Center. And uh, I'm not sure, um, you can always email me. I'm gonna, this whole presentation will be sent out, but I would love to field any questions for you. I think um, through your insurance, through Stay Well, you might have access to coaching. Um, but I think that it's, I think it's really a nice corollary to you have a patient, you have 15 minutes, you feel there's something more. They can't get into behavioral health for, I don't know how long, because I know you guys are so, so busy, but then health coaching might be another avenue that's um, maybe more accessible um, and could help. Oh, 
Ellen, are there, um, could you talk a little bit about the training and education for health coaches? Um, that yeah, so are things, if we want to refer someone or what people should look for in a health coach? I would say certification is important. Um, Diane kindly did all that work for me and had me go through Well Coaches, which I found was a really good school. Um, it's not the least expensive, but um, the training can be done in person. It can be done weekly. There's a lot of homework. You learn all about the theories. Um, and then at the end, you have to perform um, a coaching online and also take a written test. And just in the last three years, there's national board certification for health and wellness coaches. So it's similar to any sort of board exam. Um, and that kind of is, is one of the standards now that um, your training program, well coaches should be accepted by the national board as a certified program. And then some people go on to get national board certified, which I think will help in terms of reimbursement. But there are many, many different schools. Most of them are good. I would just, you know, just ask them about it. They should have some sort of experience and some sort of testing out. And they should be accepted by the National Board of Health and Wellness. Right. Person, which so if you go I to that see. website, I should add that website. They'll give you uh, an idea of the schools that are um, accepted for that certification. When I went to my certification for well coaches, um, somebody said, so, you know, what, what difference would it make if there were more health coaches? Because at that time, I think they were, I don't know, maybe it, within well coaches, maybe just a thousand, you know, what if there were 5,000 or 10,000 in the um, instructor? I said, well, I think if there were more health coaches, the world would be a kinder place. Mm -hmm. And I think that about if there were more mindfulness teachers, if there were more integrative med departments, if there were more acupuncturists, masseuses, if there were more people who would look at all of the things that make us who we are, the world would be a kinder place. And so it's been really fun to be on the page with you guys and, and to feel like we're all part of this wellness journey in, in Madison.